As Ethiopia forges ahead with plans for a massive dam to feed its growing appetite for electric power, Peter Grest explores the lands of the Omo River. Will the people who live here have to pay the price for urban development? Our World on BBC World News. The tribes on Ethiopia's Omo River are some of the most heavily armed in Africa. Their survival depends on the river, but Ethiopia is desperate for electricity, and the government is now building a dam. If we do not have 1,800 megawatts of electricity by 2011-12, all our development activities in this country will come to a screeching halt. But critics say it will trigger bloody fighting for land and water. Starvation, increased poverty, and conflict involving killing over fighting for limited resources. That's the reality. Ethiopia is moving fast. Its appetite for new electricity is enormous, but it remains one of the poorest countries in Africa, and the government is accelerating the economy at all costs. Only about a third of the population has access to electricity, most of those in the capital, Addis Ababa. But even in Addis, power cuts are a fact of daily life. They're as unpredictable as they are infuriating. Of course, everyone has to adapt and improvise, and that's precisely why the power company believes it has to produce as much electricity as it can, not just for this country, but to export to its neighbours as well. And in that respect, at least, Africa remains the dark continent. The government's solution? An ambitious program to build new generating plants. But the planners have a problem. Time. The population here is growing so fast that it's outstripping economic growth and the need for new power is critical. So the government has opted for a massive hydroelectricity project that in one hit will double the country's generating capacity. And this is the plan. The Gibi 3 project is directed to develop the hydro potential of the Great Gibi River also known as the Omo River. The dam. dam is going to be a vast structure built by the Italian civil engineering giant Cellini Costruttori. This promotional video shows how it will eventually look. It'll create a reservoir 150 kilometers long, the second biggest in sub-Saharan Africa. Its cost, 1.7 billion dollars. That's a lot of money for one of the world's most heavily indebted poor countries, and one that's in a rush to build. We're heading out across the southwestern plains to the headwaters of the Omo River. It's about a six hour drive to the Gorge country and the Gibe 3 Dam, and that's really where the story of its impact begins. Work is already well underway. The engineers from Cellini are blasting out the foundations from the main dam wall. The dam is going to be from that point to this point roughly 30, 40 meters above us. When it's finished, the wall will spread more than half a kilometer across and plunge 240 meters into the valley below the deepest of its type anywhere in the world.
Underground, they've been drilling their way through the mountainside to create a series of tunnels. This massive tunnel is one of three that will divert the waters around the main construction site just down the river. It's a huge tunnel, 15 metres tall. The whole thing is lined with concrete, and they've pushed a kilometre through the mountain to get to the other side, and they've nearly finished. In fact, the government was in such a rush to get the project going that it broke the rules. Usually, a government will study the plan's impact on the landscape, find the money, and then call for competitive tenders. But Ethiopia ignored all that. The Electricity Corporation first signed a contract directly with Salini. It then went looking for the finance and finally published the environmental studies two years after construction began. Can you understand why both the international financial institutions and the environmental critics are, are particularly concerned about the way this has been handled and why they smell a rat? I think they are trying to smell a rat where there is none. The overall environmental impact of the project is highly beneficial. It increases the amount of water in the river system. It completely regulates flooding, which was a major problem. It improves the livelihood of people downstream because they will have irrigation projects. And it does not in any way negatively affect the Turkana Lake. That is what our studies show. So there is no rat here to smell. But their handling of the contract has left the government with a huge financial hole. When they gave the job to Salini without inviting other companies to compete, they broke international transparency rules. That's why the World Bank and the European Investment Bank have both refused to fund the dam's construction, leaving a shortfall of $440 million. I think quite rightly we have an obligation not only to do the right thing, but to demonstrate very clearly that we're doing the right thing. And in order to do that, we have to go through these very meticulous processes to check all the aspects of any operation that we provide loan or guarantee to. Those processes are the reason the Ethiopian government ignored even its own rules on transparency and the environmental and social impact studies. The Electricity Corporation calls them luxurious preconditions. So they're blaming you, they're blaming EPCO for giving the, the contract to Salini without going through a competitive tendering this process. This is not the only way that in the world how America gives contract in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Why, why everything in well, Africa is unique? Iraq and Afghanistan have also been very heavily criticized. Well, I mean, they, they, you could criticize us, but as far as we do it for the good objective of the nation, the good objective of the citizens, and for the success of our development program, what, what is, the, is the problem? Now, Africa is in the dark. If we have to use very luxurious preconditions, we couldn't develop any, any head of power. Give us a choice. <laughs> What's the choice we have? Should we stay in the darkness? <laughs> The dam will change Ethiopia, electrifying its cities and towns. But what about the half a million people who live downstream? We followed the river to find out. The road takes us down into the southwest corner of Ethiopia. It's one of the poorest areas of the country. Our destination, the town of Jinka, the hub for the tribal communities who live in the lower Omo Valley. For weeks now, we've been talking to local NGOs concerned with the environment and tribal rights, and they've all been expressing the same kinds of fears. They say that the dam is likely to severely impact the environment and plunge the tribes into violent conflict. But none of them were prepared to tell us that on camera because they say that if they do publicly criticize the government, they'll be shut down. Now, the government's been very helpful to us, but those fears are very deep-seated indeed, and they have effectively stopped public debate and put an end to public comment.
The Mercy is one of the most distinctive tribes in the Lower Omo River Valley. They arrived here over 150 years ago in search of water as their homelands further to the west began to dry out. They came with their cattle. The Mercy are pastoralists. Like all of the tribes here, cows define their existence. But over the generations, they've developed a sophisticated system of agriculture that's kept them alive in one of the world's most unforgiving environments. 